evening. In this month's programme, we take a look at the spring sky. Many of you will have heard of the signs of the zodiac, names such as Aries, Taurus and Gemini are known to most people, and in the days when astrology was ranked as a true science, the zodiac was of great importance. Yet a great many people fail to realise what the zodiac actually is. Because the Earth moves around the Sun in a period of one year, the Sun seems to travel right round the sky in 12 months. The apparent yearly path of the Sun among the stars is known as the ecliptic. Obviously, one cannot see the Sun and the stars at the same time, except during the fleeting moments of a total eclipse of the Sun, but the position of the Sun in the constellations for any time can be worked out. Astronomers refer to it as the apparent sun. The zodiac is a band extending for 8 degrees to the other side of the ecliptic and it is here that the moon and the bright planets are always to be found. The reason for this is that the paths of the orbits of the planets are not sharply inclined to that of the earth so that the planets may be seen only in certain directions. Draw a, plane, a plan of the solar system on a flat piece of paper and you are not far wrong. The orbital inclination is 7 degrees for Mercury, 3 degrees for Venus, and less than this value for all the rest. This is a great help in identifying the planets. During its yearly wanderings, the Sun spends 6 months in the northern hemisphere of the sky and 6 months in the southern. This means that it must cross the celestial equator twice, once around the 22nd of March when moving from south to north, the spring or vernal equinox, and again around the 22nd of September, when moving from north to south, the autumn equinox. Therefore, on those dates, the sun must be exactly on the equator. When the constellation patterns were first drawn up, the spring equinox lay in Aries around, and were therefore known as the first point of Aries, while the autumn equinox was situated in the obscure constellation of Libra the Scales. This is no longer true, because of an in fact term procession, the positions of the poles and the equator of the sky change slightly over the years, and this must affect the positions of the equinoxes, so that by now the first point of Aries has been shifted into the adjacent constellation of Pisces of Fishes, while the first point of Libra is now in Virgo the Virgin. This means that the astrological signs of a zodiac are now out of step, and the actual constellations, but the result is not important, except to those who are naive enough to believe in astrology. So for the moment, let us consider these zodiacal constellations and see what they have to offer us. During the spring evenings, the zodiac constellations of Taurus the Bull and Gemini the Twins are setting in the west, along with the winter constellations of Orion, and Canis Major, while Cancer the Crab, Leo the Lion and Virgo the Virgin are nicely on view in the south. It is useful to have a prominent constellation that can be used as a signpost to the others in the sky and the cloud does this nicely as it is now high overhead in the northern sky. So let us begin with the northern groups. The most famous pattern of seven stars making up the cloud is only part of Ursa Major though the rest of the constellation is inconspicuous. Esa Minor contains the pole star, Polaris, which is highly luminous and which lies at a distance of nearly 700 light years. During spring evenings, the Plowasterism, which is made up of seven bright stars, can be seen high up in the northern sky. The top two stars in the bowl, Merak and Dube, are known as the pointers, because they lead the way to the pole star. When we come to Fad, followed by the four stars in the handle, Migres, Elioth, Mizar and Elked. The second star up in the handle of the plough is Elcor and Mizar, also known as the Horse and Rider, which is an easy double star visible in binoculars and is known to be a test for keen eyesight. The plough is on prominent display this season, so a number of splendid deep sky objects are on view, many of which can be seen in moderate telescopes, while they make ideal subjects for photography. 
If you are interested in photographing the deep sky objects and planets, I highly recommend Amateur Astrophotography Magazine, which is a very popular publication dedicated to astrophotographers worldwide. It has 75 pages of useful hints and tips and is brimming with exceptional photographs of solar system and deep sky objects. Please visit the website amateurastrophotography.net. Let us begin with Messier 101, known as the Pingwell Galaxy, which is located to the left of Alkyed and Mizar, forming a triangle. The galaxy is of magnitude plus 7.9 and is an ideal subject for astronomical photography. Messier 101 is a relatively large galaxy compared to the Milky Way. With a diameter of 170,000 light years, it is 70% larger than the Milky Way and it lies at a distance of 21 million light years. Lord Ross in the Republic of Ireland observed Messier 101 in his 72 inch reflector during the second half of the 19th century. It was the first to make extensive notes of the spiral structure and made several sketches. To the right of Alkyed, at a similar distance, is Messier 51, which is actually located in the nearby constellation of Cain's Venetici, the hunting dogs. Recently it was estimated to be 23 and a half million light years from our Milky Way galaxy. Messier 51 is one of the best known galaxies in the sky. Shining at magnitude plus 8.4, the galaxy and its companion, NGC 5195, are easily observed by amateur astronomers and the two galaxies may even be seen with binoculars. The galaxy was discovered on October the 13th, 1773, by Charles Messier while hunting for objects that could confuse comet hunters and was designated in Messier's catalogue as number 51. His companion galaxy, NGC 5195, was discovered in 1781 by Perry Meachin, although it was not known whether it was interacting or merely another galaxy passing at a distance. It was not until 1845 that William Parsons, the third Earl of Ross, using a 72 inch telescope at Bear Castle, found a whirlpool possessed a spiral structure. The first nebula known to have one. It was consequently named the Whirlpool Galaxy. The star Marek, one of the pointers, is of importance at this time of the year. A little below Beta S Majoris can be found Messier 97, also called the Owl Nebula, which is a planetary nebula, 1630 light years from the Earth. It has a magnitude of approximately plus 10. Close by is Messier 108, which is a faint galaxy of magnitude plus 10.7. We can both be seen with a moderate telescope of 6 inches aperture and we make ideal candidates for photographers. Now join Madras and Dubé with an imaginary line and follow this line the same distance again, high overhead, and you will come to Messier 81 and Messier 82, two galaxies which lie within half a degree of each other. There can be glimpsed in the same field of view with a 10 by 50 binoculars when the night is moonless and the sky transparent. They shine at magnitude plus 7.9 and 8.8 .8 respectively and are best seen in a 3 inch refractor. The supernova played up recently in Messier 82 and we devoted our March programme to it and supernova in general. This is available to see again on our Vermeer TV channel. To the right of Alkyed lies a constellation of Cain's Venetici, which represents the two hunting dogs, Asterion and Chara, which are being held by Buites. The name of the brightest star, Corcoroli, was given the name by Edmund Halley in honour of King Charles I of England, and is the only star brighter than magnitude plus four, so that moonlight will obscure the constellation. Corcoroli is one of the most attractive double stars for small telescopes with a colour contrast of white and pale lilac. The companion is of magnitude plus 5.5 and the pair have a separation of 19 and a half seconds of arc. Cain's Venetici contains over 20 galaxies, the brightest being Messier 94, shining at magnitude plus 8.9, 
and resting 63 at 9.3 and really make ideal targets for photographers. Messier 63 is known as the Sunflower Galaxy, which can easily be found by sweeping an area midway, midway between Corcoroli and the end star in the bear's tail. It lies at a distance of 37 million light years. Messier 94 is easily found in small telescopes as it forms a triangle with Alpha and Beta and it lies one and a half degrees above a line joining them. Messier 94 lies at a distance of 17 and a half million light years and we see it face on. Brinicis here is a small constellation which contains no stars above magnitude plus 4.3 and is actually a large dim cluster known as Mel 111 moving together through space lying at a distance of 250 light years. Once again, due to the faintness of its stars, moonlight will hide the constellation. It lies midway between Canis Venetici and Leo Minor. The name Berenices here comes from a romantic Eastern legend. Berenices, the daughter of Philadelphus, fell in love with and married her own brother, Eurgates, one of the kings of Egypt. Eurgates was required to take part in a dangerous exhibition, and she vowed that if he returned safely to her, she would dedicate her beautiful hair to Venus. Subsequently, he returned safely, and Berenices, true to her promise, cut off her long tresses and hung them in the Temple of Venus. However, they mysteriously disappeared, and when the wise men were consulted about it, one of them, an astronomer named Conan, declared that Jupiter was so enraptured by them that he had set them forever in the heavens. Being sent for by Eurgates, Conan pointed out the new constellation, saying, There behold the locks of the Queen. The constellation contains a large cluster of galaxies, visible in moderate-sized telescopes, six of which appear in the catalogue of nebula drawn up by Charles Messier, which make ideal subjects for photography. Messier 53 is a globular cluster of magnitude plus 7.6, which is just visible on dark, transparent nights, with 10 by 50 binoculars. Messier 64 is a spiral galaxy of magnitude plus 8.8, .8, it is a faint object in two and a half inch telescopes, although 10 by 8 binoculars show it reasonably well. And Messier 88 is also a galaxy, this time with an apparent magnitude of plus 10.2, which requires at least a 4 inch telescope to see it. Now, go back to the plough and following the, through the handle downward, we come first to Arcturus in Beauties, the Hairsman, which can hardly be missed as with the exception of Sirius, it is the brightest star ever visible from England. It is also prominent because of its glorious orange colour. Stars are not fixed in space, they move at great speed. It is only because they are so far away from us, we don't notice the motion, except over long timescales. Astronomers call this proper motion, and usually measure it in seconds of arc. A star's motion can either be away from us, towards us, or across our field of view. A remarkable fact about Arcturus is its great annular proper motion of 2.3 seconds of arc, the largest proper motion shown by any of the first magnitude stars, with the exception of Alpha Centauri in the Southern Hemisphere. The motion was first detected by Sir Edmund Halley in 1718. The actual speed of Arcturus is almost 90 miles per second in the direction of the constellation of Virgo. This motion has been bringing the star closer to the Earth ever since it first became visible to the naked eye nearly half a million years ago. At the moment, Arcturus is almost at its minimum distance from the solar system, about 36 and a half light years. The star is presently approaching us at a radial velocity of about 3 miles per second, which will gradually diminish to zero as the star passes or several thousand years from now. Arcturus will then move away from us as it continues its motion towards Virgo and will have faded below naked eye visibility in the course of another half a million years. 
There are a few objects of interest in the constellation, except for the binary star Hapsilon Beauties, also known as Pulcherama. It is a yellow-orange star, shining at magnitude plus 2.7, with a white magnitude 5.1 companion, which is visible in a 2-inch telescope. The rest of Beauties is rather obscure, but it is worth looking for Corona Borealis, a semicircle of stars which actually does look like a crown. Inside the circle can be found the variable star R Corona Borealis, which fluctuates in magnitude between plus 2 and 10.8. At the moment, it is near minimum brightness, so that a medium-sized telescope is needed to show it. R Corona is actually classed as a recurrent nova. R Corona stars are yellow supergiants, 10,000 times as bright as the sun, but has lost their outer envelope of hydrogen gas. Their atmospheres are rich in helium and carbon instead. Stars are element makers. Inside their interiors, hydrogen atoms fuse to make helium. When the hydrogen is used up, helium fuses to make carbon. In other words, salt. Our corona stars launch carbon dust into space in big clouds. When a cloud is aimed in our direction, we see the star eclipsed or blocked by the salt for a time. Nobody knows exactly what triggers our corona's sooty outburst, but every few years it belches out another cloud and goes into hiding again. Follow the cloud Arcturus cares still further, and we come to Virgo, where the leading star Spica is bright enough to be easily identified. The Virgin herself takes the form of a distorted Y. Note Pararama, more generally known by De Bayer's designation of Gamma Virginis, which any small telescope will show to be a spectacular binary. The components are almost exactly equal, so that here we have a case of true stellar twinning. Both components are of magnitude plus 3.6, yellow-white in colour, and easily visible in a 2-inch telescope. The orbit of the companion star is highly eccentric and often the two stars are so close only large telescopes can separate them. They were at their closest in 2007 and are now separated again. The period is 171 years. Vega contains a large cluster of faint galaxies in the area of sky above Gamma Virginis marked by the bell shape of the stars. Ten of the galaxies appear in the catalogue of Charles Messier, the brightest being Messier 49, which is a magnitude plus 8.6. The area makes an ideal subject for photography. Not far off is Leo the Lion, Regulus is the brightest star, and the sickle, shaped rather like a reverse question mark, is unique. Algebra, or Gamma Leonis, is a binary, while the other important star in the constellation, the Nebula, is suspected of being variable in brightness. Again, the plough makes an ideal signpost to the constellation. Locate the pointers and follow them in the opposite direction to the pole star, and you will soon come across the sickle. Beta Leonis, the nebula, is a white magnitude plus 1.6 star, marking one corner of a triangle of stars to the left of the sickle. In the Middle Ages, while Regulus was supposed to be of good influence, the nebula was considered to be a very unlucky star by astrologers. Gamma Leonis, Algebra, lies in the sickle. It is one of the finest binary systems in the sky, both members being giant stars of magnitude plus 2.6 and 3.8, with a contrast of orange and yellow. It is now to seen in small telescopes. I have another variable star for you. R. Leonis, which lies in the to the right of Regulus, plainly visible with the naked eye at maximum brightness. This red star varies between magnitude plus 4.4 to 11.6 over a period of 313 days and can be followed to minimum brightness with a 16th telescope. Below the main body of Leo, in the area to the left of Regulus, can be found a rich cluster of galaxies. These include Messier 65 which is a spiral galaxy seen edgewise on. It has an apparent magnitude of plus 9.3, a 
and is visible with a two and a half inch telescope and 10 by 80 binoculars. Leo is the centre of attention every November due to the Leonoid meteor shower which produced the most brilliant and prolific displays seen in modern times. The shooting stars originate from a radium point within the sickle, a little west of Gamma Leonis. The shower reaches peak activity each year between the 14th and the 17th of November and produces meteors moving very swiftly with short paths. In an average annual display, the observer will see around 70 shooting stars an hour. The Leonines are associated with Comet P. Temple Tuttle. The Great Shower of 1966 was followed by that of 1988 and the next is due to take place in 2021. In the aerial sky to the right of the sickle and to the left of the bright stars Castar and Pollux in Gemini the Twins lies a fainter constellation Cancer the Crab resembling an upside down Y which is one of the oldest of the constellations but which has only one star as bright as the fourth magnitude. One interesting star is Zeta Canceri, or Tagamin. It is an easy telescopic double, the apparent separation is almost 6 seconds of arc, and the orbital period is 1,150 years. The brighter component is itself a binary, main tube plus 5.7 and 6.2, separation half a second of arc, orbital period 60 years. There is a third, very faint component at 288 seconds of arc and there may yet be another star in the system. A small telescope gives a pleasing view of the main pair. The brightest member of the group is about three times as luminous as the Sun. There is one object of real interest. This is Pryosat, an open star cluster, inferior only to the Pleiades. Pryosat, Messier 44, is clearly visible to the naked eye whenever the sky is clear and dark. Look at the point halfway between Regulus and Pollux and you will make out two faint stars of Cancer, Delta, Manchu plus 4.2 and Gamma, 4.7. Between the two, slightly west of a line joining them, will be seen the faint shimmer of Pryosep, which has been actually named the Beehive. No individual star can be made out without a telescope, but the Pryosep is a fine example of an open cluster. If you can see it, you may be sure that the air is clear and transparent. There is nothing else of immediate interest in Cancer, but it is worth noting that the constellation lies in the zodiac, so that the bright planets pass through it from time to time. The ecliptic, the sun's apparent path, runs through the middle of Gemini, the twins, the Pryosep in Cancer, then close to Regulus, the brightest star in Leo, before arcing round above the bright star Spica in the constellation of Virgo, the Virgin. Hydra is an extremely long constellation extending more than 100 degrees from west to east. Its only prominent star is Alphard, which shines at Manchu plus 2.2. The best way to locate Alphard is to use Castor and Pollux in Gemini as a signpost and follow the line low down into the western sky. The head of the mythical snake lies below Cancer and then winds eastward between Leo and Virgo and finally ends near Libra. The constellation is not well placed for observers in the Northern Hemisphere and it requires a clear moonless night to trace out the winding form. In mythology, one story asserts that it represents the water serpent killed by Hercules. Another story, a more traditional one, connects it with the legend of Corvus the Crow. Interpretations, which it is named the Lanian Serpent, say that this monster lived in a swamp near a stream and was accustomed to ravage the country of Argos. The beast possessed several heads and the middle one was immortal. Hercules attacked it but was startled to find that each time it cut off a head, two new ones appeared. His companion, Lolius, suggested burning each stump as he severed the head, and this successfully prevented new growth. When the immortal head was cut off, the monster died, and Hercules buried the head securely under a rock. 
Afterwards, he used the serpent's blood to dip his arrows, which, it is said, made even the lightest wound inflicted, inflicted by them fatal. According to another legend, Juno, envious of the success of Hercules, sent a crab to bite his feet while he was preoccupied in his battle. Elfhard is yellow-orange in colour, a prominent star, since it is by far the brightest in this part of the sky. Tiger Brea nicknamed it Cor Hydra, the Hydra's heart, but an alternative name is Hydra's neck, sometimes referred to as a solitary one. The only deep sky object in Hydra is a large open star cluster, Messier 48, which is of magnitude plus 5.3 and covers an area the size of the full moon. Messier 48 contains about 80 stars and is a very easy object for binoculars. It is one of the most distant star clusters known. It lies 300,000 light years away. Corvus lies well south of the celestial equator, but when at its highest, as during late evenings in April, it is prominent enough. The best way to locate it is to continue the curved line beginning at the Great Bear's tail and passing through Arcturus and Spica. Corvus stands out because it lies in an extremely barren area. The constellation is formed by Gamma, magnitude plus 2.6, Beta, 2.7, Delta and Exilon, each plus three. Incidentally, Alpha Corvi, close to Exilon, is only a main two plus 4.2, even though it has been allotted the first letter of the Greek alphabet. There are no notable objects in the group. Crater the Cork is situated close by Corvus, in the back of Hydra. For northern observers, it can be found lying due south of the distinctive Triangle of Leo, and also by the prominent shape of Corvus, immediately to the east of it. In mythology, one legend considers that the cup belonged to Bacchus, while other stories refer to it as the goblet of Apollo. A Greek writer refers to it as the cup of oblivion of the Plut Plutonists. At various times, it has also been more mundanely described as the water bucket or two-handled pot. So far, we have been concentrating on the view from the northern hemisphere of the Earth, but it so happens that some of the most important objects in the stellar sky are in this far south. First and foremost, of course, are Centaurus, the Centaur, and Crux Australis, the Southern Cross, which during April evenings are almost overhead to Australians or New Zealanders. Centaurus almost surrounds the cross, because it is a large constellation. A small part of Centaurus produce, protrudes above the British horizon, but not much, and the two brilliant pointers of the cross, Alpha and Beta Centauri, are well out of view. They are not true neighbours. Alpha is the nearest of all the bright stars, at just over four light years. Its faint red dwarf companion, Paroxima, is slightly closer, but it's too faint to be seen without a powerful telescope and is not easy to identify. Beta is a distant, powerful giant. Alpha Centauri is a magnificent binary. The components are of magnitude plus 0.0 and 1.2 and the separation is great enough for the pair to be split with a very small telescope. It is a binary system with an orbital period of 79.9 years so that separation and position angle change quite quickly. Oddly enough, Alpha Centauri has never had a universally accepted proper name. Ptolemyn, Bandula and Rigel Kant have all been used, but astronomers simply refer to it as Alpha Centauri. The spring sky is therefore a kind of celestial zoo with large constellations, few bright stars, though it is of great interest to photographers because of the distant clusters of galaxies with the beehive star cluster centre of attention. I trust that you are now inspired to venture outdoors and view some of the splendid objects mentioned in tonight's programme. That's all we have time for this month. I would like to say thank you to Oliver C. Zernitz, Stuart Ledbury, Jeff Johnson, 
Steve Linden and readers of Amateur Astrophotography magazine for allowing me to use some of their impressive images of deep sky objects in this month's programme. Please visit our website, Vimeo, where you can watch all of the past shows of Astronomy in Space. And if you like this programme, please share it with your friends and members of your local astronomical society. Until we come back next month, good evening.